Yes, sir. We'll start. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. And um, yesterday we saw the intricate anatomy of the hand and the beautiful way in which all the structures are intertwined to give us a fantastic function. But how did this hand actually develop? I mean, it wasn't there in the old the animals that we see. So where did this hand come from? And uh, this is what we're going to see today. So the agenda for today is going to be the evolution of the human hand. Now, what significance does it have with doing hand surgery? It gives us a good insight into how the, the muscles are developed and how the structures are developed, why they, have, why they are the way they are. So all these things we'll be learning in the evolution. And then the embryogenesis of the hand in the developing fetus. When does the hand develop? When do the fingers form? When do the fingernails form? All this we'll be seeing. And the motor development of the hand. And after that, we'll be seeing the discussion of the morning's case of injury of the ulnar nerve at the level of the elbow. And of course, the quiz question of the day. Now, when we go into the evolution of the hand, let's start right at the very beginning about. Um, 500 million years ago, the Paleozoic age era. And there it was mainly plants that were there and fish. Now, plants and fish were the main uh, uh, creatures at that point of time in the Paleozoic era. Then, after that came the Mesozoic era, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. And all these periods were ruled by the reptiles called the dinosaurs. We have all seen the movie Jurassic Park and how the dinosaurs were controlling the entire earth. <coughs> Sorry. And then how they slowly died out. The reason, so many reasons are there, but they died out. And then we shall see the Cenozoic area which consists of the tertiary and the quaternary periods. Here, the first, the tertiary period was consisting of about 54 million years, where it was the birds that developed and the placental mammals that developed. But it was only one million years ago when <coughs> the modern species of mammals started developing. And the extinction of the larger mammals like the mammoth went about. Now, first it was fish. So many million, 500 million years ago, it was only the fish that were there. So, the clue to the development of the hand starts with the fish. Now, fish basically are of two types. We know that fish have fins. And we know that they are something related to the hand. But the modern fish are actually what are known as ray finned fish or actinopterygii. The older species are called the lobe finned fish, sarcopterygii. Now, the sarcopterygii have a very strong pectoral fin. That is, there is a single bone on both sides and both the fins are attached. So this is more representative of our upper limbs. So, and it has been proved that the human hand, as we see it now, first started development evolving from these lobe finned fish, like the sarcopterygii. They are called the old world fish. They are not present much nowadays, except for certain fish, uh, fish like the African lungfish. These African lungfish are very funny. They live in the water, but these fish, lobe fin fish, are all mainly freshwater fish. So what happens? Freshwater is in lakes. The lakes tend to dry up. So when they dry up, what happens to these fish? They can't just dry out. So what happens? These fish started to live, to adapt to living with air. So these lungfish actually have something uh, uh, like uh, our lungs. 
and these lung fish have to come out of the water every few minutes to take a gulp of air otherwise they just drown so now i do not know how many people have been to estuaries and mangroves uh, there is actually one in tamil nadu which is called pichavaram which is near kadalur if you have been there especially at the time when the tide goes out you will notice some certain fish sitting certain animals sitting on the floor of the uh, of the backwater i had been there and i noted all these uh, fish i was wondering what they were i mean you can't have fish uh, sitting on the floor and walking but i found out later that they were what is called as the mud skipper these mud skippers are also a type of lobed fin fish these lobed fin fish are very special so these are the mud skippers so what happened these fish started walking on land because their water uh, uh, source uh, fresh water usually dried up sometimes so they had to learn to walk on the land so you can see how they started walking their uh, their bones started developing and their fins became something like four limbs for walking we'll see that now now this is the mud skipper it makes holes in the ground when the water runs out they come on to the surface look at that how beautifully is using the fins to walk you can see that now and he see so this is the precursor of the upper limb that we see in human beings he uses it almost like uh, wading or walking so these are the species of the lobed fin fish now this mud skipper actually has got an abductor superficialis muscle of the pectoral fin divided into two sections usually it's a single muscle but these and these fish the specialized fish that are using it for walking have got two attachments one to the dorsal side one to the ventral side so with that both movements are powerful they can flex it and they can also extend it so that gives them the power to walk using these fins and uh, one section inserting on the dorsal ray and the other section uh, section inserting on the ventral rays they are completely amphibious fish and they use their pectoral fins to walk on the land as we saw in the video and being amphibious they are uniquely adapted to intertidal habits unlike most fish which survive the retreat of water by hiding under wet seaweed now these uh, fish don't have to hide like that they can walk very happily on the so the first sign of developing hand we have seen now so this is how the lobe fin fish went on to become the early amphibians and from early amphibians it was a short step to become the reptiles here because the developing plant life was there the fish could not harvest all those so they started going on to the land they became amphibians the limbs became became perpendicular to the spine and there was the type of movement that could be seen so they could use all the four limbs like you have in the alligator or the crocodile which uses all four limbs to walk we saw a fish that used only the front two limbs fins to walk now you are having all four limbs to walk then the reptiles came there was a change in the length of the limb the position of the limb and the direction of force of movement like these reptiles then came once the reptiles as represented by the dinosaurs they became extinct the mammals came on then the end of the dinosaurs we do not know whether the bringing about of the mammals man caused about the extinction of dinosaurs or it was vice versa so the apes started developing the primates now among the primates we have got the quadrupedal monkeys then they became bipedal that is they were walking on four limbs the monkeys then they started on walking on two limbs so this was the next change that occurred we saw the fish using the fins to walk then we saw the reptiles with a different uh, formation and walking on all four limbs 
then we came to the mammals which are walking on all four limbs then they start walking on two limbs now quadrupeds walking on four limbs can be either arboreal like the langur common langur that we see or terrestrial like the baboon now this is the baboon chimpanzee and it is now this is not walking on four limbs he has got a very funny gait now look at this he's got a very look what he is doing he is walking on the on the hind limbs but look at his front limbs he is almost on his knuckles this is called knuckle walking so these uh, apes started walking on knuckles now the structure of the limbs became different the changes in the climate and then they started walking slowly from knuckle they started standing upright and starting to walk with two limbs so bipedal gait this is the next major change that occurred now so our cousins had a very small thumb and very long metacarpal now if you see the palm of the chimpanzee it has got a very long palm very narrow and long palm and very short thumb okay so but however they had to adapt because there of a particular reason now look at this video now look at these monkeys they are called the special north actors they are called the north actors monkeys they are able to go like typical look at his nails just look at the nails of this he has got nails just like what we have so what happened is these monkeys realized as they started evolving the best fruits and the sweetest saplings the leaves were at the tip of the branches not in the main branches so they had to learn to go up to the tip of the branches to get those fruits now if they had the original claws they could not do that because the movement of the fingers of the apes was only so much only so much of flexion was possible whereas now they had to curl their fingers around the twigs smaller branches now look at that you can see it in this picture they had to curl their fingers so that they can hold and then they had to go and take they could take the fruits look at the beautiful function so this was the reason why the fingers started changing you can see the nails very nicely in this uh, part of the movie so this is where we are getting our fingers from but look at the very short thumb this thumb is not enough for opposition so the evolution of the human hand has been from the apes it has been becoming smaller 1.8 million years before christ then 1.2 million years it slowly becomes smaller and smaller shorter the palm and the thumb became longer fingers became shorter so this was the evolution of the human hand now what happened to our hand there were certain changes that occurred there was a palm rotation the thumb which was like this we know the characteristic ape thumb we call it when it is in the same plane as the palm that is what we saw in the monkeys now but now what happened this started rotating this thumb started rotating because of the rotation of the carpal metacarpal joint and the pronation of the cmc joint the thumb was like this it was supinated facing upward now it goes like this when it is facing backward so it is pronated and increased mobility of the fourth and fifth metacarpals i will be talking about this now how beautifully now if you see if you remember your anatomy we have got certain muscles called as opponens digiti minimi that is opposition of the little finger now why did those muscles develop we have an opposition of the thumb but why opposition of the little finger we'll see that now and the redirection of the hook of hamate a smaller pisiform bone and a stronger pisohamate ligament complex and the recession of the ulna and the reduction of the ulna styloid and the development of the triangular fibrocartilage complex which is allowing for this movement of pronation and supination and a strong ligament between the radius and the carpus
if you note our wrist joint is mainly an articulation between the radius and the carpus ulna is nowhere involved ulna is more involved with the pronation and supination now two important activities of the evolving human being that is the caveman there were two activities one was throwing one was clubbing now what is throwing and clubbing now look at this picture the the caveman now he has developed he has got a bipedal gait he is able to walk very comfortably on two feet but there is a problem he cannot climb trees like monkeys to get fruits and he cannot run fast like the cheetah or the leopard to catch a animal and kill it but he needed to survive so he needed food so he could not get it he could not go up the tree he could not run fast like the other animals so he had to use his developing cerebrum so he started throwing the spear so he developed a spear to throw now throwing is a very specialized movement or action because it involves a tight grip on the spear now you can see the holding of the spear you need a very tight grip then you have to bring it like that and then release it at the correct moment it has been proved that if you release the fingers about 1 millisecond late your trajectory that you have planned to throw it will miss by about 2.2 degrees radian now imagine it is 2.2 at this point if you are sending it for about 20 meters it will be about 2 feet so he will miss so he had to learn how to release it at the correct moment this was the important function that developed this was precision so here in the act of throwing the most important part of the hand that was taking part was the thumb the index finger and the middle finger and this part the radial part of the palm we already know that this is the fixed part of the hand that is the second and third metacarpals so these he is able to hold it and release it so important function of precision has been gained by throwing now by throwing a spear it will only harm the animal it would not kill the animal so this man once he throws the spear it hits the animal and the animal falls down this man runs till the animal now and he has to eat it he does not have claws like the tiger or lion to tear it apart he had to kill that animal so he learned clubbing now now this clubbing is the next important function he developed these uh, uh, equipment like for instance a stone or a club or a hammer these he developed to hit it on the head and kill the animal so that he could eat it now to develop this he had to have a very strong movement of flexion of the wrist or adduction of the wrist so this way the flexor carpi ulnaris and the importance of the ring and little fingers for power this had to develop so the entire hand has been shaped by the important uh, uh, activities of throwing and clubbing this were necessary for life for his survival and the survival of the fittest those animals or the cavemen who developed these functions became the leaders so this way power was developed we all know that the hand has got the prehensile power the prehensile function when we say prehensile function it means holding an object now a holding an object can be of two types it can be a power grip or a precision grip a precision grip is when we hold a pen a power grip when we hold a tool like this so both power and precision have developed by these acts of throwing and clubbing so now we have seen how the hand developed in the human being over the now we shall see how the embryogenesis of the hand occurs within the growing within the uterus now if you look at the time table of hand development you will find that by 27 days of gestation of fertilization the arm buds appear two small buds appear on either side and they start growing by 34 to 38 days within a week of appearance of the arm buds 
it grows very fast and the hand paddle appears by 40 by the next 10 days fingers become separated and by 9 to 10 weeks fingernails begin to form so if you look at this you will realize that by 44 to 46 days that is one and a half months since gestation, the hand has formed almost completely, the fingers have separated. So by the time the lady realizes that she is pregnant and has a confirmation of her pregnancy, the fetus's fingers are separated and completely formed. So it shows the importance of the hand. The last to evolve was this hand. So it, it, it sort of grows very fast. Now, we'll see the three-dimensional, it's a beautiful choreography of developmental processes and how it grows. Now look at the, how the, just keep noting the hand, the upper limb. The hand paddle has formed. The hand paddle is becoming wider. You can see the remnant of the fingers. Now you can see the fingers are almost completely formed in this fetus. So we'll see another video to show how it forms. That is the hand paddle. It becomes flattened out. You get the different rays forming. And then the fingers start separating from distal to proximal. You can see the almost the beautifully the, the hand is formed. This is by the end of 45 to 50 days. So we were looking at this arm bud. This is, these are the arm buds that are formed, which start growing. And then by day 40, by week 6, the hands are formed. There is a, then what happens is there is a medial rotation of the arm. The arm bud was like this when it started. Then it goes undergoes medial rotation and the formation of the elbow occurs. Then the hands meet and cross. Because of this medial rotation, they have to cross each other. Naturally, in the direction of which they are uh, growing, they, they cross each other. And the distal phalanges form, metacarpals form, and by week 10, the nail fields have formed. The middle phalanges have formed by week 11. And this shows the hand plate development. Now, in the hand, you've got different systems. You got the vascular system, you got the muscle system, you got the uh, musculoskeletal system, the bones have to form. So, how do they all form? By the fifth week, the central brachial artery has formed and continues as the interosseous artery in the forearm. All arteries branch from the brachial artery at the uh, antecubital area. The median artery is first, then the ulnar artery, then the radial artery. Yesterday, I was telling you about the median artery, that is, it is a small artery. It is a remnant of this axial artery which runs on top of the median nerve. That is formed first. But slowly, with development of the hand, it sort of becomes a remnant. It becomes a vestigial artery and the ulnar artery and the radial artery take over. Now, this is how the vascular genesis occurs. The formation of the ulnar artery and the radial artery. And what you have this is in the middle is the interosseous artery. The peripheral nerves, by the third week, we have the nerves developing as outgrowths from the cord. By the fourth week, the brachial plexus forms and advances into the limb bud. See how quick the development is. The, the, all of them are occurring there. By the fifth week, it reaches the elbow, and by the seventh week, it reaches the fingers. In about three weeks, the brachial plexus that has started forming from the cord reaches the fingers. And by seventh week, when everything is developed, the nerves are also in place. So this shows the nerve from the cord. From the cord, the outgrowths develop. They form the plexus and it continues inside and reaches the fingers by the seventh week. Skeletal development. The cells are in the, in the center of the bud. They swell to form the cartilaginous blastema. By the eighth week, the humerus starts developing. So here we have got the humerus, and here you've got the ulna and the radius. And then the blastema of the fingers, metacarpals, all these start forming. But they are not evident on x-rays till about one year. Only a few of these bones are seen. So 
when we look at the parts of the developing limb, we've got three parts. The stylopod, the zygopod, and the autopod. The stylopod refers to the proximal portion, which could be the humerus or the femur in the lower limb. The zygopod refers to the ulna and radius in the upper limb, tibia, fibula in the lower limb. And the autopod refers to the wrist and fingers in the upper limb and the ankle and toes in the lower limb. Now, skeletogenesis, first the bone is formed. We told you the bone is formed. We saw that the bone has been formed. Now what happens? How do the joints form? At the place where the joint is going to form, there is an interzone and chondrocyte differentiation and cavitation occurs. It becomes a cavity. It undergoes morphogenesis. A capsule is formed and thus the joint forms. So joint development by the fifth week, skeletal condensation progresses proximodistally. There is a continuous blastema from the shoulder to the hand. Next, chondrification occurs and areas without cell hypertrophy become the interzone. And we saw this interzone, how the cavitation occurs and it becomes a joint with a capsule. You can make out the homogeneous interzone and then it becomes a three-layered interzone. There is a separation there. Synovial mesenchyme lines it and we have the capsule forming. Muscle development. The time is the sixth week. First, the superficial muscles separate. That is a forearm flexor blastema. You have got a group of muscles. It's a muscle blastema. Now, it separates into the superficial palmar blastema and the flexor blastema. First, the flexor digitorum profundus, flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, and the flexor pollicis longus appear. Then, the flexor digitorum superficialis appears. Lastly, the palmaris longus appears. Now, this shows the muscular development of the upper limb. Now, more interesting would be the hand muscles. Now, how do these hand muscles, we speak so much about these hand muscles, the fine movements that are seen, where do they develop from? Now, if you look at the muscles in the developing fetus, they are totally different. They don't form the dorsal intraosseae and the volar intraosseae, palmar intraosseae. They have a different structure, the intraosseae dorsal dorsalis accessoria, the intermetacarpals, flexoris brevis profundi, contrahentes. Now, this contrahentes is a very important structure. And the lumbricals. This is the formation of the muscles. Slowly, they... Now, this contrahentes is an important structure. We'll see what forms. It slowly divides and forms the... Uh, this is the contrahentes plate, which forms the hypothenar and the thenar muscles. This is an important. We already know that the dorsal accessory muscles form the intraosseae and this form the thenar muscles. Now see the beautiful thenar muscles have been formed and that shows the, the level at six weeks. The contrahentes muscle there and all the nerves, all the muscles being supplied by the already available nerves. And this is in the adult, just to compare the growth in the fetus and in the adult. Now, what controls? There are three types of growth. One is called the proximodistal asymmetry or the growth. Now, this is controlled by what is known as the AER, that is the apical ectodermal ridge, which is controlled by the fibroblast growth factor 10. There are I told you there are three types of growth. One is the proximo distal, that is the proximo distal growth. The next is the radio ulnar. They have to develop differently. That is uh, controlled by the zone of polarizing activity. So you've got the apical ectodermal ridge that controls the growth of the uh, limb proximo distally. Then we have got the zone of polarizing activity, which is controlled by the sonic hedgehog protein. And then we have the dorsovolar asymmetry, which is uh, uh, controlled by the WNTSA or the LMX, limb hawks gene. Now, this is as far as the embryology of the hand. So, 